you'll allow me, I want to begin by just saying thank you. And I especially want to say thank you to all the families and especially all the parents who have small kids. I know what you've been going through the past 30 minutes. <laughs> and, and I know what's been happening in your car. Eat that right now, put it away, put it away. Keep doing that face, come on, did you get your homework? Da, 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 da. Now, when you get in that door, you better smile. Hey, we're at church. I know, God bless you. And you'll never forget, you'll never, ever, ever, ever regret doing what you've done to bring your children to the house of the Lord, even when it's extremely inconvenient. So thank you. Thank you. All right, let's wrap up our series. Have you thought about those numbers a little bit? One in four, one in three, one in two, eight and ten. Numbers that certainly tell a story, a story of what the world is like and how the world is rather dark. But it also speaks to us in a way that it reminds us that this world's not our home. And if there's anything I'd love to be or have in your mind tonight or remain in your mind tonight, to be in your mind, is simply that thought. This world is not my home. When I shared this series of lessons back home at our place, and we're just like you, living in a city in a challenge where you have all kinds of, of immorality and so many challenges around you. But when, when I shared this back home, I, I was just so amazed because the reaction there was a lot like what I've received here. Kind words, encouraging words, uplifting words, even though it's a challenging series. I had one lady back home, she came up to me and she said, I, I, I got to tell you, I never really thought, I never really thought about clothing until you shared some of those things. And I went home and cleaned out my closet. And she said, it was kind of nice I got all new clothes. But secondly, I realized, I realized that there's another reason to dress modestly than to just look at a command in Scripture and say, God said, thou shalt not. There's a thou shalt be a light to the world. And I want to be that light. And so I appreciate that attitude and I appreciate that thought from so many. Tonight what I would like for us to do is I would like for us to continue to explore the big question of why. Why? As we wrap up the series, why does God spend so much time in Scripture warning his people of sexual immorality and purity? And, 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 and something you really got to think about when you consider Scripture. Scripture wasn't written to the world, all right? Every single one of the letters, every single one of these books that we find in the book, this heavenly library, were written to believers, now, that doesn't mean that these words aren't meant for the world and aren't to be shared with the world. But when you look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, it was written to a church. But Paul didn't take out an ad in the paper and say, let me just share this with everybody. He said, I need to share this with the church. When, when, when he wrote to Ephesus, the same thing. He shared it with the church. And so when he gives these warnings and he gives these challenges that come with thou shalt not or you need to do this, that, and the other, bear in mind he's speaking to Christians. And the struggle is real. And the struggle is here. So, so why? Why does God spend so much time in Scripture warning his people of sexual immorality and impurity? Well, why does he condemn intimate associations with the ungodly? Why does he call us to be lights? Why does he implore us to live holy lives? Why are we long, longing to be lights to this world? Well, if you wanted to give it a real simple answer, you'd say, well, I want to go to heaven. <laughs> and, and Jesus said very clearly, it's for the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But there's other reasons. And let me just say they may be even bigger reasons, if you will. If you got the Heavenly Library, I want you to take down the book of 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. We're going to begin reading in verse 9 here in just a moment. Allow me, if I can, to just set the stage for you, all right? 
If you've ever studied the New Testament church, if you've ever really got into Scripture, you have probably studied about Corinth, all right? And I probably don't need to give you a lot of information if you spend any time in Scripture about Corinth. You know Corinth is that real challenging work, all right? It's going to be really hard to get a preacher to want to go to Corinth, (laughs) all right? It's going to be really hard to say, hey, honey, I got a job in Corinth. We're going to move. No, we're not. Even the pagan world, this is what's interesting about Corinth as a city. Even the pagan world saw Corinth as grossly immoral. I got you on that for a moment. In that day and age, even a person quote of the world when going, oh, Corinth. Well, there's many reasons for that. It's a port city. But it had a history. A long history of immorality. And that immorality was infiltrating the church. I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. And if you don't have the text, I got it on the screen for you. It's going to be hard for you to see, so don't strain your eyes. But I'm going to show you why I've got it up there in just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'll begin reading in verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I don't know if you caught it or not, but as we read through that text, Paul Paul is the perfect criticizer. <laughs> Here's what I mean by that. Anybody ever heard the rule if you ever want to go share a criticism with somebody else? Anybody know the rule? You ever heard of the sandwich technique? Start out with something nice, then bring it up, then finish it with something good. And if you really, really, really want to be effective, you give it the 10 to 1 ratio. 10 compliments for one criticism. All right? For example, how many of you guys here that your wife remembers the one criticism you gave her 42 years ago. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't matter how many times you complimented her cooking, she remembers the apple pie reference. She remembers. Well, here's what I want you to see that Paul did, and here's why I've got the script up here for you. If you look at the script and you divide it between the warnings and the compliments, it's dead even, dead even. What I did is I highlighted in yellow the warnings, the thou shalt nots, the thou shalt these things that are contrary to God's will. But at the same time, notice all the positive reinforcement that he gives the brethren. 
What you find is admonition mixed with adoration, condemnation with commendation. Now, now the, the negative things are certainly there. And they're there to get our attention. Let, let's just mention some of these things just so we can see them real quickly. The, the, the why... The why, you might say, why does God want us to be moral and holy throughout our lives? Why does he want us to run from every form of sexual immorality? Remember that broad stroke that we talked about that he wrote about in Ephesians 5? Why you don't go anywhere near it of the like? Well, well, here's why. You'll notice the first thing is those who practice these actions will not inherit heaven. Paul says, how much clearer do I have to say it to you now? You'll notice when you go back in that list, beginning in verse 9, he talked about other things than sexual immorality that are certainly worthy of our study and worthy of our time, greed and things of the like. But I want us to just focus on being pure, being holy. Paul says very clearly, if you are not practicing holiness there is no expectation for and hope for heaven for you. You are not going to be an heir of God's home. The, the, the immoral will not be there. Period. And if that was all he said for the negative, that should really be sufficient for us. And, and let me just mention something here real quickly to you. We're living in a world that loves to rewrite history in Scripture. We're, we're, we're living in a world, I don't know if y'all caught this, just this past week, where a leader of a major denomination got inspiration from God to change, change one of the standards of their religion that's been in place since its inception. He all of a sudden got a revelation, and it changed everything. That's our world. Paul says this doesn't change. It's not to be ugly. He's simply just saying this is the truth. And and, and then he says this. He says very clearly, the body was not made for sexual immorality. You know, there's some other statistics that I could give you. One in three. One in three Americans will get a disease from sexual immorality. Did you know that? One in three. I live and work in a college town. For college students, it's one in two. I tell you, I got to confess, when I first read that number and I went to a football game, I was like, oh, one in two? I didn't really want to sit in the student section. The body was not meant for that. Take religion out of it for just a moment. The body was not meant for that. You ever wonder why the children of Israel were implored by God not to marry and intermingle with the pagans? First of all, certainly it would turn their soul and their heart away from God. But do you know what history has shown us in those pagan cultures? There was so much disease that their children were dying at alarming rates because of the immorality. The body was not meant for that. In our society today, here's another staggering number for you in the sense that the body was not meant for that. The family was not meant for that. And here's what I mean by that. 40% of the children born in the United States of America are born out of wedlock. 40%. And according to some researchers right now, half the children growing up in the United States are growing up in homes without a mommy or a daddy together. And we wonder why kids are having so many issues. Just the natural consequences alone show us 
the body was not made for this. But then you go and you listen to Sol Solomon in Proverbs 5 and in verses 3 through 4. Solomon says, The lips of the forbidden woman drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. The forbidden fruit has always hurt man. You ever wondered why God warned Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of good and evil? It wasn't because God was just saying, you know, I'm going to see if I can test you out here. No, the tree of good and evil represent exactly what it was. It was a tree of good and evil. And until man ate of the tree, he never knew good or evil. Think about it. He never knew what evil was. He never knew what good was because it was all good. There was nothing to measure good or bad from. It was all good. But when he ate from the tree, he learned evil. That's why God didn't want man to eat from the tree. It's in the same way that God implores us now not to allow our body to be used in any way, in any form, in any means of sexual immorality. Why? Because it leads to evil. Proverbs 5, verses 8 through 12. Keep your way away from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Because a little later at the end of your life, you will groan. And your flesh and your body are consumed. And how you always said, I hate discipline. And my heart despised reproof. What you actually see here is is a sin against the body. It's a sin against the body. And, 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 and Paul is bringing that out clearly in the text. It is a sin against the body. Albert Barnes in his commentary says, It wastes the bodily energies. It produces feebleness, weakness, and disease. It impairs the strength, the strength and it shortens life. Think about it, folks. How many people do you know that are living the immoral life that have nice, comfortable, easy lives? There aren't many. Because it's also, as the Proverbs tells us, the way of the transgressor is hard. The body was not meant for it and then the third negative that he points out to us is this it, it, the body was not only not made for it but it's also the idea of a sin against the body and so you need to run from it you need to run from it run from it like joseph running from potiphar's wife it is urgent it demands a fleeing like paul says to timothy flee youthful loves if you look a little later in first corinthians 7 and in verse 1 paul will simply say it's not good for a man to even touch a woman well he's not saying talking about holding her hand or or touching your shoulder. He, he said, it's not good for you to touch a woman when it is not the time is the emphasis. And he's simply encouraging all of us to grasp and to understand that you need to run from it because it's a sin against the body. It will make your life miserable. And so what you find here right off the bat as you read the words of Paul is everything that you would expect in a sermon like this. Here's all the negatives why you shouldn't. Can I just stop right here and make a quick point? If you're involved in any way with a relationship or activity that is sexually immoral, stop. Stop. Remember the words of Jesus, the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. If you're one of the one in two men who's been captured by this pornographic world, stop. Stop. Go to somebody you can trust and lean upon to share and confess your challenge. Find an accountability partner. Get help. Stop. Don't let the deceiver take more than he's already taken. If 
you're finding yourself tempted, enticed, run. Just run. There's a reason why your heart beats so fast. There's a reason why when somebody comes in the room, you immediately close your computer. There's a reason why you're looking over your shoulder. Because you know. And your body's not meant for that. Because it carries with it weight, consequences, pain that go far beyond anything you can imagine. And if you're one of those families that's been hit, if you're one of those spouses that's been hurt, if you're one of those children growing up without both your parents, you know. Stop. Just stop. And you know what our Lord would say to you? I'm your God. Confess to me. Because I already know. I want to forgive you and help you. All right. Paul doesn't stop there. He, he doesn't just show us the negatives. He doesn't just give us the warnings. What he also is he answers the real question of why. And this is really where I want us to spend our time. Because what you find that Paul does in this incredible text is, yes, he gives the negatives. Yes, he gives us the warnings. But he also gives us the reasons why you should seek purity, why you should seek holiness. And he does it in a very powerful and encouraging way. If you'll go back, I want you to notice, and we're just going to look through a few verses here just so he gets it back into your memory and get you back focused on where are these things in, in these things that Paul's saying are going. In verse 11, he reminds us that we have been washed. We have been sanctified. We have been justified. And all of it's come through our Lord Jesus Christ. A little bit later in verse 13, he says, you were created. You were created for the Lord. When you think of somebody coming up out of the waters of baptism, it wasn't just about washing away their sins. It wasn't just about giving them a brand new start. No, God's raising them up to be his instrument, to be living a life for him to further his cause. And I want you to just kind of think of that big concept. The Lord is for the body? Just out of curiosity, raise your hand if you know what that means. The Lord is for the body. Good, because I have no idea either. And I was just somebody here knows it. No, I'm just kidding with you. But think about it. It's something you don't think about much of. What does he mean? The Lord is for the body? And then he goes on to say, the body is for the Lord? Well, well what's his point? Well, I, I want you to see that what Paul does here is he does something that he's done many other times in Scripture, all right? It's one of those passages that implores us to look at the bigger picture. He's imploring us to look beyond our limited sphere of focus, all right? For, for example, for example, do y'all remember the story of Elisha and his servant when they were surrounded by the Syrians? Anybody remember that story? Remember? Okay, do you not remember that story? I can tell it to you in about 45 minutes, and then we can go on. Who remembers that story? Yeah, but you're like, raise your hand. There's a game on tonight. <laughs> the Syrians have surrounded Dothan, where Elisha and his servant are. An ominous force. Elisha's just kicked back, taking it easy. Kind of sitting on the front porch with a toothpick, going, hmm, no big deal. He's, he's really, he's not scared. His servant, on the other hand, freaking out. Freaking out. 
And Elisha kind of looks over at him as this guy's going all crazy. He said, Lord, open his eyes. Y'all remember that story? And the Lord gave him the vision to see what was real. And they were surrounded by a heavenly army with chariots of fire. Anybody remember how that war ended? The Syrians didn't win, by the way. Remember what Paul said when he talked about the Christian armor in Ephesians 6? Y'all remember that story? You know, before he talked about the armor, he said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. This isn't a physical battle. There's other principalities. There's other rulers. There's another war going on that's much greater than this. And and what was it Jesus said very clearly to Pilate? When Pilate says, are you a king? He goes, oh yeah, I'm a king. But my kingdom is what? Well, not of this world. I want you to do something here for me. I want you to challenge yourself to see a world that's real, but we don't think about much of. Because that's exactly what Paul is referring to here. He's referring to a world, and he's referring to a battle that goes beyond us. One of our men back in our home congregation described it like this. He said, ISIS is not our biggest enemy. Socialism, world hunger, the economy, race relations, these are all physical battles. They're temporal battles. Now, they deserve our attention, and yes, they may be serious. But God calls the child of God to see a much bigger battle. It's the battle of darkness and light. It's a battle with eternal ramifications. It's a heavenly battle, and it's raging all around us. So he wants us to look beyond. He wants us to look out. And so what you find is you find Paul using the why motives. And the first thing he says is you need to be mindful of your redemption motivation. Here's why. Here's why you seek to live a pure life. Here's why you seek to live holy. Here's why you run and abstain from everything that's even closely related to anything immoral. Here's why you don't go near those things. Here's why you're, you're, you're more conservative in your dress. You're more conservative in your entertainment. You're more conservative in where you go. He, he, here's why maybe in your friend's eyes you're a goody-goody. Here's why you may seem odd. Because you recognize the value of the redemption price that was paid for you. You're reminded that Christ washed you. Go back, if you would, to verse 11. Notice he said, you were washed. Now, I know most of us probably didn't think of baptism as a washing. You didn't get out a rag and as far as soap and just just washed yourself over. What it represents is the idea of a cleansing. You were stained beyond anyone in any man's ability to cleanse, but God washed you. And he didn't just wash you, he justified you. Anybody here ever tried to justify something stupid you've done? Anybody? Oh, I have. If my wife was here, she'd have amen that in a second. And you, and you try to explain yourself, oh, well, here's why. And you think it sounded pretty good, and they're just looking at you going, really? Did you just, really? The Lord justified us. It's not the same meaning. It means to pronounce blameless, not guiltless. You're guilty. But you no longer carry the blame. And sanctified. Anybody know what sanctified means? Set apart. Can I share with you something that just boggles my mind? Should the Christian's Facebook look like everybody else's in the world? Should our clothing look like everybody else's? Should our checkbook and how we spend our money look like everybody else's? No. That's the whole point of being set apart. But here's the point you got to grasp on that. Not just set apart or separated. 
But everything that was set apart in the Old Testament, all the instruments, all the utensils, everything with the sacrifices, they were set apart to what? God. God says, hmm, I want the best part. This is what I want. And in essence, when you think of your redemption, God's going, this, this is mine, this is what I want. And he paid the price. N- n- notice, notice, if you would, verses 12 and, and 13. Kind of interesting when you look at them in the text. Why all of a sudden does Paul kind of get into this little debate? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I want to be dominated by anything. Food's meant for the stomach, stomach for the food. More, more than likely, what he's actually doing is he's answering He's answering common discourses of the day and arguments for sexual immorality. That the, the pagan would say, you know what? What's food there for? To eat! So what's sex for? To enjoy! Go enjoy! Just like a hamburger. It's food! Enjoy! Well, who's to tell you you can't do it? All things are lawful. Paul goes, no, not all things. And even some things that are are not helpful. And so his counter argument here is to remember your reason why. Secondly, we have a purpose motivation. And our purpose motivation is this. Our bodies have now been created for the Lord. When, when God made man back in the garden, he made man in his image and he gave man a purpose. And he's always had a purpose and a design for men. And, and he gave man, though, however, the right, the free will to choose which purpose he would choose. Isn't it interesting that Job, when you look back at the life of Job, Job proved his loyalty to God so much that when Satan was just cruising around looking for somebody to tempt, What did God say? If you're really looking for somebody, have you considered my servant Job? Now, incident, would you want God to say that about you? I'll be your servant, just don't say that to Satan. But God was so confident in Job. He belongs to me. He belongs to me so much. See what you can do, Satan. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. What's your body created for? Have you ever thought about that? Now, some of you may be like me. You like to work out a little bit. We're one of those weirdos in the world. I get it. Most of you are saying, why are you running? Something chasing you? You know, what, what's the deal here? No, I do it for fun. <laughs> really? <laughs> you do that for fun? Oh, yeah, it's great. Is that what your body was meant for? Was your body just meant for you to just dress it up every day and make it look real pretty so everybody go, oh, yeah. And so you could walk around like the fawns and go, "Mm mm-hmm. Was your body just meant to be an instrument of slave labor? Some of you probably feel like that all the time. Please don't everybody else in the room. And you know what's interesting about our bodies? We agonize over what our bodies look like more than anything else. Isn't that crazy? And you know what our Lord's telling us? I created your body to help me. You ever seen it like that? I've created your body to be a force in my kingdom. I've created you so that you could show the world that my kingdom is not of this world while Satan may be seeking ways to devour us tempting us lying to us our God is wanting to use us in that heavenly battle you ever consider the book of Revelation what happened to many of those in the book of Revelation anybody know what happened to many of them they died for their faith They used their body 
to glorify the Lord to the very name. You think any of those folks regret it now? Those saints that were crying out, how long, O oh Lord, for you avenge our blood? How long, how long? Hey, how about those that were in the, the church that didn't defile their garments, even though they were in a pagan society? You think they regretted it now? I want you to think about something. What we don't realize is that when we seek to serve God and do God's will, sure, there may be some repercussions from people in a physical way around us, but you have no idea what battle was just won in the heavenly realm because of your faith. You have no idea how far Satan may have been pushed back. You remember what Jesus said to Peter when he talked about my church? Upon this rock, I will build my church. And what did he say? In the gates of what? The gates of what? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Have you ever thought about what the visual implication is there? If the gates of hell are not able to stop the church, it's not Satan attacking the Christian. If the gates of hell are going to be busted through by the church, it's the church going through Satan and pushing him back. It's what God does in the body of his people. Because the body is for the Lord. And then thirdly, what does he give us? He gives us a glorious motivation. Not just a redemptive motivation to remember what has been done for you. Not just a purpose motivation, what you can do now. But a glorious motivation of what is to come. And that is the idea that the body is his temple. It's the fascinating idea that the mercy seat of God now dwells in the heart of the believer. And he dwells in those who will honor him with their holiness. We live in a nation. Did you realize that in our nation there's over $100 billion dollars? Over a hundred billion dollars invested in properties, in church buildings, all built to a God who says very clearly that he dwells in temples not made by hands. A hundred billion dollars to a God who doesn't dwell in that building. Because he dwells in his people. He dwells in the people who have been set apart for him. If you've ever studied the Old Testament, you know that the Old Testament is all about types. And in the New Testament, you have the anti-type. In other words, the Old Testament is the figure. Through Christ, you get the real thing. For example, the Passover feast. It's a type. It's not the real thing. What's the real thing? This table, right? Right? The sacrifices of bulls and goats. The type. The real thing's Jesus. The temple. The type. The real thing. His priesthood now. The Christian. See, what God's asking us to do is open our minds to look beyond. And if you really think about it, if you really, 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 really think about it, most of the time when it comes to the idea of anything that is sexually immoral, it is an instant gratification that is focused right now on this specific time period, it's this specific moment, it's this specific impulse, it's this specific desire, and it carries such a heavy weight of con consequence. When God's saying, no, I want you to look to what's bigger. I want you to look beyond. And so what you see is a glorious motivation that the Lord is for the body. 
And what God does in a very powerful way through his grace and mercy is he takes the weak, he takes the hopeless, he takes the humble, he takes the used, he takes the burdened, and he gives them hope. And no life is too wretched. No body is too marred. It can't be recreated through the blood of his son and used in his service. Go and sin no more. Be that one person. Be that one person. You know what I hear all the time? People that know that I work with kids a lot. You know, it's really impossible for kids to be pure these days. You just really can't ask that. You can't expect it. I'm like, what? I know so many kids who are great kids. Do y'all? Who are pure. Who get it. And I applaud them. They want to be the one. I, I, I know families who really want to be the one pure family. It's not easy making decisions that other families don't want to make. But they're willing to be the one. And it just takes one church to say, here. The Lord dwells here. Not in these walls, but in these hearts. We'll be that one church. Because I would love one day to think that one day my Lord may have said to the tempter himself, You ever considered Phil, my servant? And that I fought a battle for him. He's not asking me to go feed every hungry person in the world. He's not asking me to give every dime away. He's just asking me to give him a dwelling place. To be pure. And that's my gift to him. Who wants to be the one? I'll be the one. Tonight, as we wrap it all up, how you doing? How you doing? Is there something we can help you with? Is there something you need to share? I can promise you, you're not the only one dealing with it. There's power in confession. There's power in opening yourself up. There's power in repentance. And praise be to God that we have a Lord that no matter how far away we may think we can roam, His loving, tender arm can bring us back home. And if that's you tonight, we implore you. We implore you to come back home. To be sanctified. To be justified. To be the one. The one pure light in this dark world. If we can help you in any way do that tonight, won't you come while we stand and sing?